Hey, I, we began our first Books and Authors series of 2020, 2020, the year of Corona, with the one and only Francis Spufford, uh, born in 1964, author of five highly praised books of nonfiction, which as his bio on his publisher's page says, uh, as described as either bizarre or brilliant, and usually as both. Uh, his book, Unapologetic, some of you I know in the parish have read is a brilliant look at Christian faith from the inside. Um, and in 27, 2007, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. He teaches writing at Goldsmiths College, University of London, lives near Cambridge, and is married to Canon Jessica Martin, uh, who is also going to be talking with us. And he has published this wonderful book, Golden Hill, which we are going to talk to or talk about. Francis, so thank you so much for joining us. Neil, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, Francis, uh, Golden Hill uh, is a fun read, a genre bending read. Can you, I was going to give a summary, I told you I would, but I'm not going to do that. Can you give us a quick summary of the plot without revealing any of the uh, bits that we have to discover in reading? That's surprisingly difficult, but I've had, I've had some practice at, at this. Um, it's one of those frustrating books where um, you don't find out till the very end what, what, the, what the main character was doing all along. But um, okay, it's November 1746, and in the very small town of New York, population around 7,000, um, a guy gets off a ship from London who is this um, personable child whose name, he says suspiciously, is Mr. Smith, an okay. obvious alibi or alias for something. Um, My name is everything. Um, who has got with him a piece of... Exactly. Well, or is it? Um, but he has in his pocket a piece of paper which is like, like the kind of 18th century equivalent of a, of a bearer bond, um, which is either worth a huge amount of money um, or is worth nothing and he's a con artist um, and in order to find out which he is you have to send a query back across the Atlantic by sailing ship which takes about six weeks uh, get an answer from the bank in London that issued this thing and then have the answer travel the other way again across the Atlantic for another six weeks so we're about Ooh, 12 weeks or so, um, Mr. Smith exists in this kind of limbo in which, like, like the kind of the cat in, the, the cat in, um, in Schrodinger's box, where he may be either a con artist or somebody very rich you should defer to, and people kind of have to treat him as, as both. And while those 12 weeks run, he gets into more or less every conceivable kind of trouble you could get into a, a, a small, very talkative and gossip oriented town like like 1746 New York, um, because this is not only a novel about the 18th century, it's also a novel written as much as I could manage like an 18th century novel. And in the mid 18th century, the novel hadn't got polite yet and it hadn't worked out how to separate out your kind of highbrow civilized pleasures from your lowbrow, ridiculous, crude, but enjoyable pleasures. So they did all of them at once. So, so, um, so the adventures of Mr. Smith contain virtually everything that could possibly happen to one person. He fights a duel, he gets involved in a law case, um, he gets sent to prison twice, um, he gets put on trial, he falls in love, he goes to a ball, he plays a high stakes card game, um, he Is gets involved in a political fight? intrigue. Um, oh yeah, no, no, and, and of course the sword fight in the, in, in the snow. Um, he, he makes friends, he gets involved in a riot, um, and if I've done it right, you should have your suspicions about who he is and what he's doing there, but you shouldn't get them absolutely, definitely confirmed until pretty much the last page. Mm -hmm. Um, which makes it difficult to talk about it. But as I said, I've, I've practiced. So I, 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 yeah, let's give it a go. Yeah, that's so great. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I, uh, it written 
with a, the sort of genre bending like an 18th century novel, but in a style that feels contemporary in 21st century, I will say. So, uh, which is an interesting thing to do to make this novel set in the past feel today. Well, if I manage to do that, that's great because that's what I was that's what I was trying to do, and it felt. Sometimes it felt like you know squaring a circle, um, believing in impossible things before before breakfast. Um, um, because I, the thing about the thing about the mid eighteenth century is that it is simultaneously a very long time ago, and it's also at the beginning of the modern world, and therefore the place we recognise now, where many of the same issues and anxieties and ways for people to imagine themselves as individual souls and as citizens were all beginning to 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 come together so they are not strangers to us people people back then and, and it ought to be possible both to have the the, the kind of pleasure of time traveling and also to feel that in fact, hey, this is home. It's like a slightly weird version of home, but it's still, it's still our world. And after a bit, I wanted you to stop noticing the the funny way of talking and the fact that all the men had wigs on, and and just to go, okay, no, no, this is, this is this is a small town beh behaving like a small town does with a nice extra irony that the small town is Manhattan, um, yes. which is famous for not being small, but, but um, yeah. I, I saw a, a YouTube video, uh, Waterstones, I did, think did of you sort of like describing the places uh, in, showing it was a video of modern day Manhattan with sort of tags of what 1746 New York was, was, was there. Yeah, that was, that was me and my, me and my iPhone. Um, <laughs> walking around Lower Manhattan, which is what I did to write the book anyway, um, because it turns out that although every single building from 18th century New York, with, I think there's an exception, there's, a, there's a, a restaurant left from the 1790s and there's a, um, an insurance brokerage in Chinatown that's from like the 7, 1785 or something, but everything else gone because um, it burnt down twice over the course of the revolution and the early 19th century. And it's also like the most expensive real, real estate in the world, which gives people a mighty incentive to kind of knock down your neat little two-story 18th century house and, and, and put up something that's 60 stories high. Um, but the street plan is weirdly the same. So I walked around Lower Manhattan um, with a photocopy of an 18th century street map, trying very hard to ignore all the buildings things and just to kind of look at my feet and listen to what the what the ground underneath the asphalt was telling me uh, um and every so every so now and again i i i took out my iphone i i filmed what was there now for one of the major scenes of of the novel i kind of cheated because really anywhere that wasn't down at the southern tip of the island it would have been a field and another field and yeah. possibly like a forest or another field but, but down at the bottom you've got um you've got some you've got some kind of some nice ironies and some nice peculiarities of, of trying to see the past on top of on top of the present but really it's not a big city world that was something i wanted to bring out because mr smith comes from London which is a big city and he's got hopelessly bad reflexes for dealing with a small town he thinks that he's Mr Sophisticated come among the rubes but it's kind of the other way around in the same way that if you came from contemporary Manhattan and you stepped into a pretty small Texan town you would be the one who didn't know what you were doing and who would need to seek help from friendly from friendly inhabitants I, uh, the, the dean of my seminary grew up in Manhattan in, in an apartment uh, there, and I grew up in a very small town in East Texas. Uh, and hearing her describe her childhood, it, I, I, it felt like we, we might as well have grown up in completely different countries. So different was our experience uh, of the world, which is an interesting thing. And yeah. 
Go ahead. I've been, I've been, I mean, I've been, I've been somebody who's lived in a village and somebody who's, who's lived in London. And I think the differences are, are fascinating. And the biggest one for me is that life in a big city involves endless encounters with, with strangers, people you are never going to meet again. And it allows people to, um, well, telling lies is putting it strongly, but it allows people to, to make themselves up as they go along, to invent a persona, try it out on the, the guy in the grocery store or the guy in the coffee shop, and if they don't like it, hey, you're never going to meet those people again. So it doesn't matter very much. You can be this kind of fluid being who, who changes from encounter to encounter. In a small town, though, everybody knows who you are, and they remember what you said the last time. You, you know you came into their shop and and talked to them so you can't really make yourself up as you as you go along like like that um mr and smith, mr. smith is very used to the idea. sorry no like mr smith tries to he tries to put on different masks uh, he does but everyone and remembers the previous mask <laughs> exactly and the more he does it the more, more unreliable he he seems mm. Oh, how can I put this in a coded way, which is not completely fair to him. He is, he is, you know, in his own terms, he has good reasons for, for, for wanting mm -hmm. to and what he is in fact hiding is something that would get him into deep trouble if the people he, he met knew what it knew what it was but all of his techniques of passing charmingly along through the world depend on depend on having a big city around him and new york then just is not that mm -hmm. so um he gets into snowballing trouble trouble that gets gets bigger from from kind of day to day there's this wonderful line at the beginning uh, the the opening few pages you, the reader you're immediately confused just like the people of new york who is this mr smith what's happening uh, and when he, he talks to Lovell and he says, I may as well have been born again when I stepped ashore. You, a new man before you, new made. I have no history here and no character. And what I am is all and what I will be. Uh, it reminded me of a uh, yep. famous scene in Ben Franklin's autobiography where he walks into Philadelphia carrying two loaves of bread as a complete new man. You're, you're playing with American mythology here. Was that fun to do or? I am. Oh, it was. Um, and it, it's, yeah. And I'm playing with the overlap between American mythology and kind of uh, British mythology too, because, because we tell stories like that as well, that they aren't as central to us as they, mm. as they, as they have been to you. Um, um, yeah, I mean, John Locke saying in the beginning, all the world was America. The idea that, that, that there's, this, there's this place which represents a second chance for everybody to kind of to, to, start, to start over, not just to start over in terms of what they do, but in terms of what they are as well, as if you could kind of invent your own moral character as you, as you go along. And there is a kind of grace in that. There is, there is, it's like a kind of secular version of 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 forgiveness, um, but it has dangers too because it, it depends on how you get along with all of the people you meet and whether they consent to let you start again from scratch or whether they really, really, really want to know who you've been before. And if a great deal of money is is at stake people are much less comfortable going kind of hey you are whatever you say you are you and your bearer bond that's fine um um but i mean and it's never complete the kind of the kind of grace we allow to people to say this is day one year one the moment i begin again it depends very much on on who they are and whether we think they belong in the kind of category of human being which is allowed to start from to start from scratch it's much it's much harder being some kinds of 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 human if if your face declares that you are 
other, an outsider in, in some way, then it's much harder to go, by the way, I insist on defining myself because other people will be defining you before you even, you even open your mouth. Um, Mr. Smith has been an actor in London, is one of the things we, we, we pick up. So he's had some practice at going, this is the role and I'm gonna step right into it right now, but that doesn't completely work. Just as the myths we tell about new beginnings are never completely true. You can't really wipe away the past entirely. However valuable the freedom you get from your new beginning, from the moment when you turn up in Philadelphia with you, two loaves of bread, you still have to reckon with all the things you've been before and all the things that people see in your face, whether you want them to or not. Uh, that, that's so good. And it's one of the themes in the novel that uh, Smith, I don't want to give away too much, does have a sort of rebirth by the end, a yep. deep transformation, but it's, it's not by, it's actually the exact opposite of becoming someone different. <laughs> it's actually yep. sort of, becoming who he is, yep. that he experiences this new birth. And some of that is him deciding to kind of, to take possession of the mistakes he's made since oh. he, since he's arrived in, in New York. He was, he was under the impression that since he had, from his point of view, a good moral justification for being, for being slippery and, and, uh, that he didn't owe anything to anybody he met, but actually he makes some connections. Um, mm -hmm. He makes some connections in New York, which really matter to him. He, he does, he falls in love, he makes a friend, um, and he manages to injure people he actually, he actually cares about. And part of what gets him reborn at the end, um, um, when we see him leaving in a sledge on the afternoon of, of, of Christmas day, um, is that he's kind of yeah he's he's he has he has taken he has taken possession of of his own history he has stopped claiming to be a blank slate right uh the, what i haven't asked this yet but what in where did you get the idea to write golden hill i mean it, it's I, it's several different ideas and i you know i used to be not a novelist but a, a non-fiction writer and um and I was fascinated by very early New York as a place because I found this this one sentence in a in a, a history of the British Empire, right, which said which said that in 1753 New York beat London at cricket. And I thought, <laughs> wow, what kind of lost world is this in which cricket is a kind of transatlantic game? Um, and then I thought, this is weird because no matter how badly things worked out between Britain and its other former colonies, they all still play cricket. We're still playing the Indians and the Australians and the Pakistanis and the Sri Lankans and everybody else who was ever part of the British Empire still playing cricket. Why is the United States the only non-cricket playing former Baseball. thing? Did the revolution, exactly, where did cricket metamorphose into baseball in some way? And I thought you could, you could, you could do this slightly weird sports history of the American Revolution about how cricket turned into baseball. And then I realized that I didn't know anything at all about baseball and not very much about cricket either. And thought, hang on, I've, I've, I'm off the subject here. Why, why am I interested? And I realized that it was the idea of the place. It was the idea of, of this city which was still half British and half becoming something else where people would play cricket on the common um, mm -hmm. and be still working up recognizably towards the kind of towards the break with Britain 30 years later and what would that be like? So I, the setting I was interested in um, and my, my late father was a historian of money um, and he had got me fascinated with, with how early modern people transferred vast amounts of money around when they didn't just want to fill a chest with, with, with gold coins. And I thought this could go so wrong when he described how bills of exchange, 18th century bearer bonds worked. And I thought there is a, there is a, there is a, a, there is a story waiting to be told here. Um, There's that wonderful and, um, 
there, there's that wonderful scene where uh, Smith is getting his money in America and it's like <laughs> every colony has a different bill. Uh, yeah. It's, it's so incredibly confusing how anything yep. works. That's, that's the moment in the first chapter when, that's the first, that's the scene in the moment in the first chapter where, where you realize and Smith realize, realizes that he is not the sophisticate among, among the provincial innocents, that there's stuff he doesn't know here because the American colonies run on paper money and he has never seen this stuff before. What's more, they run on 13 different kinds of paper money um, all with different valuations against the pound sterling, depending on the different colonies, not to mention incredible printed things, which are receipts for whiskey in a bonded warehouse in Baltimore and things that entitle you to five bushels of cured tobacco um, in Charleston and, and, and stuff. I mean, insanely complicated currency. You can, you can really see why Alexander Hamilton went, we will have a dollar, just the one dollar, it will be divided into exactly 100 cents and it will be worth the same in every single state of the union because till then it had been the most baroque financial system you could, you could, you could, possibly, you could possibly imagine. And Benjamin Franklin was responsible for printing quite a lot of these, That's right. these, these, these insanely complicated forms of, of paper money. There's a lovely series done from Philadelphia with leaves printed on the on um but then ah oh, sorry i could i could get i could geek yeah, so, out about early american paper, paper money so, for so, much so too long here so i'm going to stop new york money uh and then where where do we get oh yeah smith um smith comes from my pleasure in real 18th century novels and their heroes who are both worldly wise and somehow managed to stay innocent at the same at the same time um heroes like like tom jones to whom everything happens but who you are still rooting for on 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 the last page and who still managed to mean well no matter what has happened in in between um and i i had been i ah, I have to be very careful how I how I how I talk about this, but there are some people that Smith um, Smith is based on in in the history of London. London being quite a, a surprisingly diverse mm -hmm. place. Um, so, oh, I can't talk about this very well, can I? Um, that, that um, is, yeah, that uh, you have to read um, the novel, folks. <laughs> okay, sorry. Now I. I, I no, I, I cannot give away Mr. Smith's secret. My, 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 my lips just stick together when I try to. Yeah. Uh, my tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. If I could, it, yeah. It's right, it's right. Uh, it's, uh, he's, it's, you're right, you do root for him. He keeps making such horrible decisions. And, and it, I found, uh, rereading it, it was painful. Like, oh, please, Smith, don't. Please, no, I know you're going to do this. Don't. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm afraid so. He's, and you think when you first meet him, I mean, he comes in and simultaneously we get him in this new place trying to work out New York and we get New York looking at him trying to work out him. And, and he talks very fast and he's very charming. So you assume he must be extremely competent, but he's not. He's very young. He's very young and he, he's making it up as he goes along, usually very badly and he, he makes it to the end of the book by the skin of his teeth um yeah. but but yeah and i i am interested in that kind of in that kind of essence both it's kind of downside because he, he does a hell of a lot of damage mm -hmm. on his on his way through the book and and the ways in which it's genuinely sometimes what goodness is like as it as it wanders through the world, bumping into the furniture and being inconvenient. Because I mean, he is, and he's many things. He's a sinner, but he is he is also good in some ways. I mean, he is he is somebody who 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 has a virtuous purpose. I'm in danger of giving it away again. He has a virtuous purpose, and he manages to hold to it despite all of the the trail of destruction he leaves behind him. And he doesn't have to, right? He he uh, he's no, in the new world. He no, can take no. and run. The one thing, the one thing one can say is that he is not he is not a rich boy entertaining himself. He is he is somebody on a mission. Um, 
um, and he could he could run away um, and he's highly tempted to run away at various at various points um, I should say that the other thing that came into it was that I wanted to write a book with a genuinely bad tempered female lead um, she is because something else. <laughs> she is um, and uh, and and it strikes me that a lot of the kind of sassy heroines people write in in the past actually it's skin deep they're really just lovely and straightforward and this seems unfair that, that female characters don't get to be genuinely obnoxious so so she's genuinely obnoxious and bad tempered so so tabitha lovell the merchant's daughter who smith falls for um is really not a wholly nice or good or good person um um and the seemed to me to be a kind of piece of fictional pleasure and energy involved it, 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 you know available there in, in writing somebody who he would just do things that would make you widen your eyes and gasp with 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 disbelief um and she does sort of fall for smith in return so far as she is capable of it but um but there's a an awful lot of um there's an awful lot of noise generated by her by her character and the the signal of the signal of mutual affection only just just gets through yes she uh you, you, moments you feel like uh, you're in dialogue in the sort of jane austen in the in the the drawing room you know the witty banter back and forth and and then tabitha just raises the stakes to a really uncomfortable level yeah. <laughs> i mean she is she is bored senseless. She, she is, um, this is a real category of 18th century people. Um, mm. girls, from, girls from families that were prosperous enough to educate their daughters and then that didn't really give them anything mm. to do. So, so she is a human kind of gyroscope of frustration whirling, yeah. whirling away and, and looking for an outlet basically in mischief. Um, Smith's destructive powers are mostly accidental. Hers are, are completely deliberate. Yes, uh, the the ending line of the novel is quite a, a lovely sort of summation of her character. I won't give it away, but uh, it's that's quite, the quite problem. Lovely. Yeah. Uh, one one thing we haven't quite talked about uh, is one of the the central themes or uh, facts of 18th century uh, New York and England and uh, that plays a part in this novel is the existence of uh, racism and not just racism, but uh, slavery. And I, I just, uh, Samuel Johnson, I just read this quote that he says, uh, it's, I, I, this is paraphrased, ironic that the uh, Americans are yelping the loudest for liberty while also enslaving these people. And of the 7,000 people in New York, 1,000 are slaves. Can you talk yeah. about how it's a delicate subject for an English Englishman, a white it is. man. Um, and okay, oh, so oh. let us start the delicate subject by me pointing out that, um, as Tabitha's father does in the book, that it's the English that bankrolled the um, that bankrolled the transatlantic slave trade. And just because not that many slaves ended up in 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 metropolitan Britain mm -hmm. itself doesn't mean we weren't in it up to our up to our eyeballs. Um, mm -hmm. Um, but what happened in the 13 colonies was, was slavery up close. And because of the way that sort of later American history works out, people assume that the North was somehow abolitionist from the, from, from the get go. And this is, this is not the case. New York, like everywhere else, I mean, Benjamin Franklin, this is a, right, here is a, a genuinely morally shocking thing. When Benjamin Franklin was a rising young printer, he thought, um, what can I do to increase my capital fastest? I will buy African-American children because they're really cheap that, that way. And then, you know, you, you clear the biggest profit later on. That's somebody who thinks his way and reasons his way towards understanding the moral evil involved, but he didn't start there. Um, and New York, I mean, it didn't do kind of industrial or plantation slavery, it did domestic slavery. So most of the cooks, waiters, handymen, longshoremen, um, odd job guys in, 
in 18th century New York were Africans. I mean, recent Africans yes. just off the ship, um, um, speaking West African languages, mm -hmm. um, uh, many of them West African Muslims. In fact, if you go to the African American burial ground in in New York, which was just outside the the city limits of the 18th century city, um, quite a number of them are buried with with small tokens indicating that they were on the quiet, keeping up Islamic Islamic piety. Um, mm -hmm. um, so you have this life, which is which is running alongside the the kind of the 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 white life, um, really right alongside, in the same rooms, in the same in the same kitchens, but which is has got a very different history behind it. Um, and it seemed to me, as somebody who kind of is and isn't an outsider to this to this story, that um, it needed to be there in the history, not in a kind of special department marked when we're thinking about the evils of slavery, but just there all along as part of the, the fabric of daily life. And Mr. Smith, of course, has a particular reason for, for noticing it, which I can't talk about. But, um, um, but it seems to me that, that it's somewhere at the root of any story which takes good and evil seriously ought to be engaging with with how nearby kind of bondage is and any story which wants to think seriously and hopefully about freedom mm -hmm. and the 18th century american story is a story about about freedom that you have to acknowledge the ironies from the beginning the ones dr johnson was pointing to Dr. Johnson, of course, was a bad-tempered old Tory, and, um, and that's that's a that's an 18th-century zinger. The kind of kind of you want liberty? Ha! Let's start off with the slaves. But um, yeah, but yeah. that's um, but he was not he was not wrong. Um, it was relatively easy in Britain to to go to go. Um, well, we've made an immense profit from the slave trade. We'll we'll abolish it. Um, beginning of the nineteenth century, and then we'll make ourselves feel good by sending the Royal Navy to patrol West Africa and to intercept any remaining slave trade. And then we'll use that in order to forget that we were ever involved in this. And the eighteenth century black population of London, which was you know quite quite large. Um, was disproportionately all men because of the way that the, the trade worked. It was boys and men who ended up in, in, in London. So they all married um, white Londoners um, who had children who married other white Londoners who had children who married other white Londoners. And by the time you got to the mid 19th century, you got some vast proportion of the of the of the white population of London who have African ancestors, but they've all forgotten about it, and they think of race as a problem that happens elsewhere. So, so the British get to let themselves off the hook much, much too easily, and it's only in the last what is it a twenty thirty years that British historians have started digging here and are thinking hang on, we really do have to, have to, have to face up to our, to our history. Um, in, in the United States, it was too big a deal to be, to be brushed over like, mm. like, like that. It's, it's in your story. It, it was in our story too, all along, but we, we kind of whitewashed it. Um, and Golden Hill, in ways I can't talk about, is a, is a, is a book that's supposed to put its hand on its heart and not whitewash. Right. I mean, to be fair, uh, the America, America has also tried to whitewash uh, in the, we had a, that whole little thing called the Civil War. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I believe I have heard of that. Yeah. Uh, but since then, uh, a lot of um, um, our, our own history is trying to whitewash that and trying, one of the things your novel does kind of beautifully is showing the ways it functioned in sort of our founding narrative and not in not in grotesque 
uh, I mean, there is a little bit of the grotesque in the novel too. In it, uh, yeah. But, but uh, there's a scene here, if I can read it, where uh, Mr. Smith is talking with Tabitha, as you mentioned, his love interest. And Smith glanced at Zephyra, who's a slave. Evidently, Tabitha did not categorize her as company or as a source of conversation. It was true that he himself had not yet heard her speak. Yeah. I, and that, I, to me, that scene actually is one of the most powerful scenes of sort of showing the, the, the sort of silent humiliation and shaming and uh, that there are these people who are present who aren't really people. And so we don't even, we can pretend as though they don't exist. Yeah. As if they were kind of human appliances. Yes without opinions or feelings or thoughts yeah. uh, to weigh in on any matter. Um, and, and so one of the things the book does is just beautifully show that uh, functioning in a, in a context that we don't imagine as a place with slavery, like New York, you know. Yeah, um, where it ran into kind of the 1820s, 30s, I think, um, and there were still people who'd been born slaves in New York at the time of at the time of the Civil War. Um, um, the past is both a long time ago and and yesterday, always at the same at the same time. Um, and and it is simultaneously true that we get to we get to be washed clean by grace and that it casts a long shadow that we have to keep reckoning with. Um, and in some way, I'm not enough of a theologian to to kind of articulate. <laughs> you only get the grace and the second chance if you are honest about how hard it is to shake off the wrongs of 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 the past. You don't get to minimize the bad stuff as a way of kind of fast forwarding to the good stuff. Yeah, there's uh, all those wonderful lines in the the prophets about uh, God saying, "I don't want your." your sacrifices, your bulls, your calves. It's sort of like the people are trying to speed up the repentance process. If we can just get the ritual right, then yeah. the bad things we've been doing, they'll go away and God will be happy. And God's like, no, this is, uh, this is a much deeper problem to reckon with. And confession plays a part yeah, of and, and actually, you don't get to stop thinking about this because you'd find it convenient to do so. Um, yes. Yes, uh, confession plays a part in the novel. There's a wonderful scene in Trinity Wall Street, uh, a church still in existence, a, a little church in New York. Yep, although, I mean, and, and a church lucky enough for its, for its kind of, its couple of parish acres to, to now have, you know, Goldman Sachs as a tenant, which must make it kind of, kind of handy sorting out the annual budget, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but it's not the same Trinity Wall Street because that burned down as well. So it's an even smaller church from, from a few decades before the one that's standing there now that Mr. Smith goes into on Sunday morning um, for the Book of Common Prayer, morning prayer, of course. Yeah. Um, which I understand you've been having during lockdown. Um, Mr. Yeah. Smith would be at home in your, in your, in your, in your morning prayer. Uh, yes, the, the, there's the wonderful confession, uh, devices and desires of our own hearts, right? That this uh, is is in the novel. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I, it's very difficult to write kind of straight on about a moment when a character takes themselves to church because they want to go to church and are actually paying attention to the, to the service. Um, um, so I had to handle it obliquely, and it, it's a passage that maybe comes across as 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 ironic about the the congregation bobbing up and down in their in their box pews. Um, but the space is left there for Mr. Smith to absolutely mean it, as he says, as he says the words of the of the of the general of the general confession. It the book tries to leave him alone with. God, which is kind of complicated by the fact that I'm still having to keep the secret of what it is that he's talking to God about. Otherwise, the, the I, I give away the plot of the the plot of the book. But it's like a kind of a sidelong glance at something 
deeply serious. It, 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 I, I don't know. It would not have been quite believable if the, this sort of slippery character, Mr. Smith, we see him go to church and in, in deeply reverential bowing, yeah. kneeling, weeping tears of uh, repentance. You know, we would, uh, it would have sort of stuck out. Oh, too deep for words. Um, um, I, suppose, I, I don't think I'm giving away too much if I point out that Mr. Smith is a son of the manse. He, his, his, his father, it turns out, is, um, is an Anglican priest from the, from the deep English countryside. So church is very, very familiar to him. Um, but he's also, you know, he's an, he's an actor and a, and a bad boy who has, been, who has been living in the big city. And um, so, no, it's not like he takes it it's not like he he takes it kind of completely seriously, but he doesn't take it lightly either. And um, sounds like my confessions. <laughs> I mean, if I'm perfectly honest, sounds like everyone's confessions, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> that. Uh, there, um, there things you miss in church because we're not all together. Is you know, hearing the people who are super late in then the responses and all the people who read with funny voices or you know. All yeah. these distractions and ticks, and yet through that grace can shine. Absolutely, and it's actually very hard. Speaking for myself on lockdown, it's very hard, kind of doing without the kind of murmur and and background noise of the rest of the body of Christ getting on with it, um, with 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 their own stuff to 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 the, to, to to bring to to. To, to to God's attention and to the to the holy table, it's um, there is something deeply sustaining about the company of your fellow sinners, no matter how annoying they may sometimes they may sometimes be. Um, um, so I I also, I also had a small bet with myself that I, I would manage to get church going into the novel seriously and not as a kind of piece of historical tourism because um, there is a tendency in historical novels either to leave out religion altogether because it's too difficult and you don't want to go there um, or to treat it as a kind of period feature like like the wigs or the or the long embroidered coats um, whereas this is the modern world it's just the beginning of the modern world so the religion means as much to the people there as it does to us now um and they should only be laughed at as much as we should be laughed at um right. it should ideally be the the kind comedy that we would wish to have applied to ourselves yes a lot of it, uh there isn't this cynical it's it, it's a passage where smith is at church that is 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 realistic with uh slightly ironic and funny uh, you know yeah. funny but, but not cynical Yes, that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying for. Um, um, I hope it's not a cynical book. I mean, it's oh, no. it's quite a grim book in places. It, it bad things are true, but I hope that it's. I hope it's reasonably hopeful and funny as well, because <laughs> one of the advantages of an 18th century novel is that they're allowed to be ridiculous and to do slapstick, right next to tragedy if necessary. So. Uh, uh, the, yeah, it, it is, uh, it, it isn't simply grim, it is quite funny, and there is a sort of redemption there. Um, it, it's a hard-won redemption. How, how is it writing a novel and trying to have you know, grace, redemption, but in a way that isn't uh, preachy or uh, saccharine or does the plot just carry it or how 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 is no, that uh, um it's partly helpless on my part i don't mean to say i am so gifted that it all comes easily i mean that um i think that the way I, I i i tend to think of it is that if you've got if you've got the gospel in your head as 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 the kind of the great underlying story of the world then even when you're not thinking about it that minute straight on it even when you're trying to tell some other story it functions the gospel does as a kind of a tractor like the magnet underneath the piece of paper that pulls the iron filings into a 
into into particular shape it's it's as if it's as if things things in the story you're telling pull of their own accord towards mm -hmm. towards bits of the of the of of the gospel narrative and i'm not saying i'm not saying it isn't hard work but it, it it's partly just to do with a perception of what the what the shape of things and what human stories what the shape of human stories is um and then you just try and report it um in some ways it's i mean england is not a place where where there's much of a temptation to take religious storytelling piously on the contrary people people are much more inclined to 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 laugh at it so in some ways it comes easily to come to it sideways on mm -hmm. through through laughter and irony and through the things seen out of the corner of your eye um and um but basically i'm 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 stuck with thinking that the story of guilt and redemption is the story and it just is you know so if you're going to tell a story there will be guilt and with any luck there'll be redemption that's right yes uh, you, you didn't sit down and say i'm going to write a christian novel no, well, no, no, I really didn't. people um, to love jesus more or something like no that. no i didn't um um for one thing i wouldn't presume and also i'd be terrible at it um and it would be propaganda which is bad right. but, um, propaganda equals bad art right. so um um no, I, I thought I was telling a story about money in American history and slavery and um, dancing the minuet and people wearing wigs and more money and um, and bad tempered women with witty dialogue and stuff. Um, the the fact that it ends on 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 Christmas Day and that there is sin and redemption in it is just um, it just sort of happened. If, if God is real, if this any of this stuff is actually true, then it would kind of happen, wouldn't and it? It's going to happen. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, we don't have to force the subject. Uh, uh, no, no, because the subject is not actually a a detached, separate subject yeah. marked religion. It's the subject. It's it's the subject of 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 living, which is quite large and goes all the way to the to the margin, so it will come up on its own, I, I think. I, perhaps one of the things a novel can do well, especially a novel like this, is uh, you know, in addition to just being delightful, uh, also sort of show us how narrating our lives grace actually happens. And, you know, God bless the Apostle Paul, but most of us don't have a Damascus road. Most of us blunder again and again, yeah. and then things happen of which maybe we have some choice maybe we have little choice and grace comes through yeah um yes it's always been the 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 once only and that's all that was required aspect of the damascus road that strikes me as not true to everybody else's experience my in my in my experience um you need a great many bright flashes and nudges on the shoulder and and um and moments of personal disaster before you you consent to pay attention. Um, who knows? Perhaps perhaps the road to Damascus was just like particularly. Perhaps Paul was particularly. I don't. I don't think I'm even going to go there. Let's 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 leave. Uh, some... L L Remember, Luke is telling the story. It's not in Acts. So it, that also. This is true. This is true. <laughs> you know, he's. It's not Paul's telling the story. Paul tells his story a little bit differently when he describes it. Uh, well, Francis, thank you so much for talking with us about Golden Hill. It is a delightful novel. I encourage you all to read it. Uh, there's so much I didn't get to talk about. Uh, we talked about money. We didn't talk about sex. Uh, uh, no, no, some of that. Um, it is an 18th century novel, so it's not very civilized. So, so there is some sex with people who shouldn't be having sex with each other. There is, and there's a rooftop chase. I haven't mentioned I the rooftop. <laughs> one of my one of my favorite parts of the book. Um, Literally a, a, a sheet, a bed sheet dangling down that you climb up to get yep. to the room. Um, but then partly 
the reason that's there is that I get to go kind of, they were high above the streets of Manhattan as much as 40 feet up. So. Yes, yeah, so now that you, you wouldn't be able to see, uh, you'd be in yeah. shadows from the buildings, right? You would, you would. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, the, the sex and the money, and it all plays a part in the plot too. It, it, I mean, it's not, uh, so William Faulkner said he loved Jane Austen because she wrote books all about sex and money. And this yeah. is, <laughs> is, is here in Golden Hill too. So it, it, it pushes the, the plot forward. So uh, one last question um, for you. Yeah. Is what are you doing uh, in these strange times? <laughs> to uh, stay sane? Uh, are you staying sane? I don't want to presume. Uh, what's um, helping you? Mainly with a, with a, with a few frayed edges. Um, I mean, I, I and, and, and my wife and my 14-year-old daughter are in a house that's large enough so that we can kind of be glad to see each other at breakfast, go into different rooms, and then be glad to see each other again at, 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 at lunchtime. Um, I finished a novel just before lockdown began. Um, so I'm working my way through small tasks and finding it kind of difficult to concentrate. Um, we all I, the global pandemic is quite distracting. Um, I haven't learned uh, French yet. I have all this time. Why haven't I learned French? <laughs> quite. Um, um, I've, I've um, attempted to master cooking sourdough bread and my starter won't start. Um, and um, uh, I haven't learnt kind of Armenian or become a chess grandmaster or, or learn to play the cello or any of that stuff. Um, I really miss sitting in cafes. I was the kind of writer who likes to sit in the corner of a cafe with a laptop, hearing my fellow humans going in the background. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting that back when, God willing, we all do. That's right. Uh, uh, well, all right, one last question. Are you reading? What are you reading right now? I, I oh, know you um, love to read. I'm reading right now. Um, I've just started a novel by Richard, Richard Powers. Okay. Um, because I really liked the overstory, his book about trees. This one seems to be about cranes and about cranes, the birds, um, and about... Um, about brain injuries, but I'm only on page two, so I can't tell you very much, very much more than that. Um, and what else am I reading? Um, I'm reading about Silicon Valley in the 1990s for my possible next project. So that's research. Uh, I hope you'll, you'll uh, uh, sort of burlesque uh, 18th century style set in Silicon Valley, I would find that. I, I think what my, my, my prose is taking off its wig and stopping dancing the minuet the uh, moment I reach San Francisco, I promise. Uh, the idea of Mark Zuckerberg in a, in a, in a wig in the 18th century would, is, is uh, the Yeah. <laughs> or something. Anyway, it's certainly very something. That's right. Well, I think I'm going to end on that awkward comment. Uh, my recording, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And I encourage everyone at St. Albans to pick up this book. Uh, pick up Unapologetic as well. It's, uh, and The Boy That Books Built is also, or The Boy The Books Built, right? Did I get the title right? Uh, it's also an incredible novel. Uh, not novel, but book, memoir. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you very much.